I'm Fry Gilliard, writer in residence, University of South Alabama, and I'm here with my colleague Cynthia Tucker, journalist in residence at South Alabama. And today we have the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Kern Jackson, uh, who is uh, head of the African American Studies program here. But more importantly for today, uh, we're going to talk to him about his role as co-writer and co-producer of the award-winning film, Descendant. Um, you've been busy. A little bit, a little bit. <laughs> tell us, uh, tell us the, I mean, the trajectory of this film has been amazing ever since it debuted at Sundance. Yeah. Um, you've been all over the place. I have, I have, and it's been um, really uh, educational for me to, to go where the film has gone. But actually the process of the film is almost seven, eight years in the making. Uh, <clears throat> Margaret and I sort of met um, going into her uh, film, Order of Myths. And you're talking about Margaret Brown, the producer. Right, right, okay. Yeah, she's the director and she's the, uh, you know, and somehow we sort of vibe in uh, coming out of that film and thinking about mobile-centric themes and what would be interesting to, to sort of uh, do a, a cinema verite piece on. And um, yeah, and I had already been doing a lot of field work around um, not so much Africa town, but just black neighborhoods in Mobile County or black enclaves in Mobile County, particularly ones that constantly shift and change boundaries like down the Bay or Maysville or uh, Sandtown. And, and Africatown was one of those neighborhoods. And it just so happened I had interviewed some of the uh, descendants of folks who claim over on the Clotilde. And also I had interviewed people in the Plateau Magazine, Happy Hills area who uh, knew of the ship and, 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 and knew where it was and, and talked about it. And um, those types of things sort of overlaid with my interest in carnival and uh, and so, yeah, so, so that's sort of how this, this uh, Clotilde uh, investigation um, began. Um, yeah. So you have been researching black neighborhoods in Mobile for years now. Mm -hmm. What was it about Africatown in particular then mm -hmm. that helped you and Margaret decide this is the documentary? Was it the story of the Clotilda? Yeah, no. <laughs> the, what was fascinating to me uh, before um, before Ben Rains and bringing the attention to the Clotilde was the fact that Africa Town already had a tremendous amount of civic advocacy going on, uh, and, and and a lot of returnees. Uh, I call people who go away from Mobile to go to school or whatever, I call them been tos because they've been to someplace else and they always come back and re-engage uh, in, in their in their post-career um, life. And so, um, so there's the Mobile County Training School Alumni Association, there's CHESS, which is a, a community uh, health and environmental advocacy group, there's MEJAC, which is a another environmental justice group, uh, the National Park Service uh, uh, Trails and um, um, Division was doing work there. And of course, all 18 churches were doing things. And so um, I found out about all that through the, the uh, there, there's a housing group, um, Fair Housing Group, mm -hmm. um, that, that has uh, involvement in all those things. I was talking to Teresa Bettis and she was like, you need to go, go to these meetings. I was like, why? She said, because they're old, kind, old timey kind of meetings where people are getting things done. I was like, oh, I want to see what that's all about. Um, not just from an African American studies point of view, but just from a you know personal sense of social justice point of view. And I went out there and got involved with this thing called the Blue Way. i never forget, Nasheed Rushton, brother Nasheed, he, uh, he, he, he kept coming out here to the university saying, Dr. Jackson, and he's just a man, you know, 20 years my senior, call me doctor. He said, Dr. Jackson, I want you to come. I want you to go to these Blue Way meetings because we're trying to create a kayak trail. And I was like, do brothers and sisters kayak? He said, they don't yet, but they may in the future. And I was like, okay, let me attend the meeting, Nasheed. And, um, and the Blue Way uh, started having um, events and I started getting involved with the rituals and the festival of the events. 
and these events were to claim the space underneath the Cochrane Africa Town Bridge, right on the other side of the railroad track, but just up against the Mobile River. And the confluence of all the participants in that, for me, is what led to my participating in the movie. Because why? For two or three years, um, these organizations and this Blue Way Committee were already doing things. So when the movie hit, oh, not when the movie hit, but when the Clotilde discovery started to happen, all these community things were already in place to be engaged, right? To be people to be interviewed, people who have been thinking about making these connections and everything. And so when the, when the ship was so-called uh, discovered, um, I called Mark and said, "Bring your camera. Let's 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 go to work. You know, let let's see let's see what what we can get out of this." And um, and she came. She came with full crew. She didn't even. There was no question. I mean, we had such a relationship of trust by that time that there didn't need to be no going round and round about spending money, right? Because it it was all it was it was already a full goal. And, and that just came, that just comes out of having friendships and relationships. And, um, and then we started to storyboard and chart and figure out who would be good and blah, blah, blah. So for people who are watching this, who may not know the whole Clotilda story, mm. um, just uh, give us a little, um, you know, thumbnail of it because it's both unique and right. universal at the same well, time. Well, I mean, I think first we should we should sort of acknowledge the fact that all kind of folks have been doing work on that on this particular area. Right. But I always like to start with the fact that there were already black people in the quarters before the mayors even dreamt up sending a ship across Africa because they were hell bent secessionist. Right. Right. Right, so there were black people living in the quarters and in, in the mills and the turpentine factories and providing the labor, enslaved folk providing the labor. But then, as uh, you know, as it became apparent there was going to be civil unrest, uh, 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 Mayor and, and Foster and them decided they were going to go to Weta and pick up a boatload of fresh saltwater Negroes because that's how they thought of it. Right. And this is roughly 1860. 1859. And, you know, you know, and I think um, Sylvia Diolf and, and Natalie Robertson and um, and even Nick Tabor has a new book that just came out recently, um, sort of document the, the historical record of that moment. And um, but all three of them seem to land on the fact that it was a decision of arrogance. Right. Like, <laughs> like. Right. We are white men. This is what we do, right? And uh, and and sort of put all of these confluence of things in, in motion. Um, and and you know, as Joel Billingsley, my my friend here at the university, uh, who is uh, interestingly has an interesting connection to de descendancy, um, you know, they 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 put together and fitted a schooner that was fast and quick and that could move throughout the Mississippi Sound and avoid the blockade. And they did make it to Weta and they got, well, we know that at least 110 people survived. I suspect some people died on the way back, but um, yeah. And, and those 110 um, were smuggled, people were smuggled into, uh, into the Mobile River and split up amongst various um, agribusinesses uh, to be labor. And um, so in, in some way, Africatown is born out of their experience, but I think it's really important to say out of the experience of the black folk who were already here, even if there was a um, subsequent tension, right? But all of those people who came over in Clotilde married into folks who was already here or had children. I don't even want to say married in because some, some things aren't said. There's this discussion amongst descendants about who's a pure descendant. Well, how the hell are you gonna figure out who's a pure descendant? I mean, that's not how human beings function. And particularly coming out of a time period when you were not supposed to talk about your enslaved experience, or you don't want to because of the trauma of it all. Uh, so that's real problematic. Um, I'm, I'm having an issue with that, clearly. But um, yeah, I mean, that's that's sort of the, the framework of the, of the narrative. 
I come to because the, the, the community was, there was a quarter was already there in Plateau. There was a community already there in Magazine Point. There was a community already there in Kelly Hill. And then uh, in No Man's Land, which is where the landing, where we had the festival under the bridge, that area was called No Man's Land uh, at the tip of Magazine Point. So, um, yeah, I just, I just want to make it clear that um, people of African descent were already there. Um, this other community of Africans came and um, what, what we have now is Africatown is, comes out of the confluence of the two. And so after these, the Civil War is over, mm. um, a group of these 110 then um, settle in what is now known as Africatown. And there are already black people living there. Mm -hmm. uh, and you talked about tension. Would you talk about that a little bit more? Well, I mean, I think anytime you have a new group of folk who come in, one of the interesting things about the Clotilde Africa is the Union Baptist Church story. And, okay, so they, they, um, they had become Baptist and were going over to Stone Street and walking through the, the swamp to get to church. They decided they wanted to have their own old landmark church in Africatown and came up with the land. And the fact that the, the descendants of the Clotilde Africans came up with the land for the church to be built, I think is, um, is real important because they had a certain, Joe Womack talks about this in the movie, um, they had a certain sort of volition about how to plug themselves into capitalism. And I think that, you know, people formerly enslaved folk who didn't have any ex exposure to being free didn't have that. And I mean, I think that's at the heart of the tension I mean, I see that among ethnic groups today in the United States, you know, same, same sorts of tension. Um, but uh, yeah, but interestingly enough, uh, the founding of the, the Union Baptist Church um, in the organizing, the organization that, that, the, the, that Southern Baptist, Missionary Baptist community provided, like, it's almost like you and I coming up when we went to Key Club or or you know, we went to BTU or whatever, and we learned our organizational skills and, and this sort of thing. Um, quite naturally, the folks who had known freedom and who, who, who had, after five years of enslavement had plugged themselves into the capitalist economy of Mobile County, they were taking control. And there was a certain, I think there was a certain amount of resentment. But I think the folks, the black folks in, 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 in Plateau Magazine Point who were already there did sort of tip their hat or acknowledge that because in that church, as those people were dying off, those who had come over on the boat, who stayed here and didn't go up country to Bessemer or Wilcox County, all these places, they did have rituals in the Baptist, inside the Baptist church of the Africans holding the babies, right? So even if I disagree with you, even if you know I resent the fact that you had this leadership or that you're navigating capitalism much better than I may be navigating it, I still want you to touch my baby, <laughs> right? <laughs> and well, maybe that'll rub off spiritually or economically or, you know, whatever. My child will have more volition than me, you know? And I think that that, um, that is why I talk about the whole descendancy thing is those folks in Africa town who, who know their lineage sort of stand instead, but give the rest of us black folk access to that narrative and to those feelings and to that, that having happened. Right, because there's a certain amount of empowerment that goes with that. You have a unique sense, I think, of the richness of history in this community. Black history, but how it weaves its way through the life of this community. Mm -hmm. And yet you grew up in a very different part of the country. I mean, and yeah. so talk a little bit about how you came to have a, a sense of Mobile. Wow. Okay. So my mama's people are from Mobile. Okay. They come off the avenue, Jefferson Davis Avenue, which is now Martin Luther King Avenue. A better name, by the way. A better name, but ironically, not as culturally rich. That's true. And um, so... I'm everybody a, knew Davis Avenue. Everybody knew Davis Avenue. It was, a, it was a corridor of commerce. And my mama left here, I think at 16 or 17, to go up to Ohio like a lot of people from Alabama do, to go to school. And uh, met my daddy and they were in the civil rights movement and protests and doing all that mess. 
it had me. Right, so I'm, I'm birthed out of the civil rights right in the sweet spot around 1965. And uh, my parents didn't stay together. My daddy went on to, to run a nursery school in Detroit and my mama went on to do social work in uh, Washington, D.C., Baltimore area. And so I come up in my formative years in Washington, D.C. But, you know, everybody had a big mama or grandparents or whatever. And so they always send you home. I was watching Till the other night and I was thinking, oh man, that's real, that's real familiar to me, being sent back. But anyway, I digress. So I got sent back on Eastern Airlines. Back then they would pin your note to you and just put you on a plane and then you would be in Alabama. <laughs> and I think I flew by myself for the first time when I was four or five years old. Can't do that these days. But, but you know, coming back frequently Christmas, Easter, Mardi Gras, summertime, just for the heck of it, somebody died. You know, I was here a lot. Right. So I always right. had, you know, ethnographically, I didn't know I was a folklorist at the time. I had one foot in and one foot out. So you have, in folklore terms, you have emic and etic experiences. And I was always up under the old people, learning how to ask questions. And my grandmother, was a, she was a, a teacher at county and she was a vice principal at county, Mobile County Training School. And I can remember going out there when she was a teaching or a educator. And I can remember going out Telegraph Road, passing the lumber mills, crossing, literally crossing the railroad tracks to get into north of the city proper limit, you know, and going up the hill to, to the school and going into Africa town and knowing I was in a different place, right? I, you know, I wouldn't think about that for years on down the road, but yeah. And so she would take me out there when I was little. Now she would be transferred to other schools around Mobile County and Old Shell Road, Theodore, Orange Grove, all kind of places. But I had a auntie, the play aunt, who remained out there at county and who would, who would transfer it over to uh, Vida. And uh, so my grandmother's name is Esther Lang. And she had a good friend she talked with at county named um, Valina McCants, who 98, who's still living. And it would turn out that Valina McCants would become my Cujo Lewis. She would become my central informant, and she would, uh, in her own inimitable way, direct my career. Oh, you want to write a dissertation? Here, write it about this. Like, right? You, you want to study carnival? I don't want you to study carnival. I'm taking you to Lewis Quarters, because this is where my, my children live, and I need you to sort of analyze this. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Right, because you do what you. If you are being authentic and you have good ethics, you do what you're told. So let me back you up a bit and ask you to talk just a little bit about the importance of Mobile County Training School and Africa Town. Just like the church, the property for the, one of the first, I think it's the first public high school for African Americans in the state of Alabama, was in Plateau, Alabama, which would become Africa Town. And the property for that school would be donated by a Clotilde African descendant, right? And the people who were populated as educators would be folks from Tuskegee. So you had the Booker T. Washington thing happening, right? Uh, people who had had classes with George Washington Carver, right? People, in fact, you know, one of the, the, the most famed uh, graduates of Mobile County Training School would be Albert Murray, who was Ralph Ellison's best friend. That's Albert Murray who would found jazz at Lincoln Center, who would write the Army Americans and the Spyglass and Stomping the Blues and was become a cultural critic. And he would make his name in Harlem. But he, he was from Plateau Magazine Point. Um, 
And, you know, he if he were living, he would tell you he was the bastard child of a student from Tuskegee. So Tuskegee and Africatown are intertwined. Um, the legacy of that type of, of Votech education, practical, let me train you for your, it's a training school. You go there to get some training so you can get a job. But we're going to send the, we're going to send the humanities oriented folk to the north. Right? Because everybody can't do that. Or everybody can't hit a ball. Uh, so many, uh, I, that high school has so many baseball hall of famers, it don't make no sense. That's because it was poor. They didn't have no equipment, so they didn't have balls and bats, and so they used uh, the top off of a beer or a soda water bottle, and they would spin it, and you tried to try to hit it with a broom handle. Well, hell, that thing has such a natural curve. Hank Aaron, Satchel Page, and all these people, they weren't from Africatown, but, but Tommy Agee and Cleon Jones were, Ozzy Smith. It has such a natural curve that their eye-hand coordination was so good, it, 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 it took a lot of them all the way to the Baseball Hall of Fame. Five Mobile Baseball Hall of Fame. Five. That's insane. Right. You know, and um, and they played with they. It's just like the Dominican Republic today or Puerto Rico today. They played with little or nothing. Yep. Played with little or nothing. Um. Yep. So um, yeah. So, just a little bit more about the rest of your career. You're you're famous now for Descendant. But you talked a little bit about Miss McCants, yeah. but you must have already, you were already here studying, so you must have already been thinking about ethnography and oral oh, yeah, yeah, history yeah, yeah. and folklore. So yeah, from how the, did those become interest? Uh, I mean, I think from the time Jean McIver and Sue Walker brought me here, uh, the the overwhelming richness of the region it's insane from 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 Cody and Bala Battery all the way out to Washington County with the Mowars that would be the black Indians they ain't got no power and can't put up a, a casino anyhow from, uh, and everywhere in between the the culture is so just rich and the resiliency of the various communities is so apparent through folk culture, through you know things that I'm interested in, through storytelling and the like, and then you had these pockets of of people, expert storytellers who have been documenting all along the way. I was talking this morning about Eugene Walton, and you know Eugene's uh, effect on Margaret. Eugene Walton gave Margaret her first camera, her first movie camera, and had little sessions with her. And he was sober, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And talking about art and what you know, this types of things. So, the, so Eugene Walter or somebody in my uh, informant uh, group, uh, Paulette Horton, who would go on to write the Davis Avenue story and the impact of that book. Um, there are pockets of people who are telling the narratives. You coming from up there in Monroeville, Fry coming, you know, coming from over here in Spring Hill. There are pockets of these narrators that that provide all the context. Uh, Octavia Levert. I mean, you may not like her stuff, but it's useful, right? Uh, Sue and her poet. I mean, there are these artists, uh, formal and informal, published and unpublished, um, that I think this is a small pond and you can get to know these folks and they can sort of set you off. But I tell you what, my mo most, the, the, the ethnographic technique I, I like to use the most is bartending. I like to serve drinks and meet people. And I ain't talking about down on Dolphin Street. I'm talking about private bars. I like to put on my white coat. I like to have my bar tools. And I like to go into people's homes and, per and personal spaces and learn about the intricacies of how our community functions and works and how, what we celebrate and what, we, what our values are. And I think, um, Bartending with the crew here in, in Mobile between Order of Myths and Descendant really, really, really inform my point of view about the, the richness that, to which you speak. So you like tending bar, mm -hmm. I guess in part because you can observe while being invisible. 
but right. you can't take notes. No. So how do you translate what you've learned? Well, I mean, I think in part, I, I do take field notes when I get home. And then I just start to repeat people's stories. And it, I repeat them and repeat them and repeat them until they become my own. And I start to sort of flesh out, like there's certain things you can't talk about, right? Like um, people's sexual mores, you know, and, and you have to sort of say, ah, I'm not gonna deal with that. But, um, I end up teaching classes and having my students investigate the themes that I find when I bartend, right? So it becomes a collective thing. Okay, we're looking at this topic now. What do we all think? These, let's go talk to some folks. Let's collect some oral narrative, you know. And that gives us a window into my observations about, say, um, race and how race is constructed, or, or how work. Um, in how the everydayness of work informs the richness of the community or what have you. So I just like to spin it into my teaching. And when I teach it, I become more proficient, they become proficient and uh, in, the, in the information. And, um, and it, is very, it is very oral. I mean, it is very oral. Right now we got students who, in an oral narrative class, who we're bringing along to explore down the bay. And they don't know it yet, but they are about to start interviewing down debaters uh, and then in acting on some of the technique and interviewing techniques that we've been learning in class. And um, so that's just the current example. But yeah, I end up teaching it. Anything else you want to tell us about? No, I, mean, I just think that there's a lot of there are a lot of stories out there uh, for people who want to write or, or investigate, um, and there's plenty of plenty of space for a lot more work to be done. I'm, I'm just sort of excited now about my students, you know, and their interest, and some of them want to, re God bless them, some of them want to remain in Mobile County, and 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 do this kind of work, and um, you know, that's what satisfies me. Well, they're learning from the best. Oh, well. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all for having me. Thank appreciate you very it. Much. Appreciate it. Yes.